Je ne parle pas française. As my children say, Mama, non parle française en France, because I can't. Uh, a pleasure to be back here in Biarritz and to see so many of you I know and a lot of new faces as well. Uh, I really appreciate that first lecture. I'm not going to give you our epigenetic changes, but we in fact have two papers showing profound changes of the mu opioid receptor with increased methylation in long-term opiate-dependent people now in pharmacotherapy. But we do not know whether or not that uh, long-term pharmacotherapy or the heroin preceding it in fact contributed to this. So I want to be sure I have the right thing to progress. It is the 50th anniversary this spring of the publication of our first paper, uh, Developing Methadone Maintenance Treatment at the Rockefeller University. And that's Dole Nyswander and myself as a wee child 50 years ago when we published this first paper. There's three domains of factors which I think are pertinent to this session. Genetic factors, multiple variants of multiple genes may increase or perhaps decrease the vulnerability to develop an addiction. Environmental factors, huge. They include prenatal and perinatal effects, which we know now, uh, the last speaker described it, is not just your mother loves you or doesn't, but it's actually epigenetic changes that can occur very early on. And again, we're studying this at the bench with rodents, and at the humans, we can really look only at the DNA. Cues set and setting play a role. Stress responsivity plays a huge role. So epigenetics, cues, stress responsivity, and of course the drug itself. And with the third domain, we know that the drugs can profoundly alter gene expression, connectivity, the whole synapsis network. Now several years ago, published by our group in 1998, we described two major variants of the human mu opioid receptor. C17T, very common in African origin people, and A118G, very common in Caucasians and Asians. Both of these variants are importantly in the N-terminus, in the coding region of the mu opioid receptor. And we predicted that the physiology might be altered by the presence of these variants in addition to possibly the propensity to develop an addiction. We went on to show at the bench in cellular molecular constructs, as shown in orange here, that the variant receptor has greater binding of beta endorphin and greater signal transduction as shown on the right after beta endorphin binds than the prototype shown in blue. So this is greater binding, greater signaling, but further studies from Sadi's group and our group showed few receptors on cell surface. So when many, including Professor O'Brien, asked me, is it a gain of function or loss of function? The answer is both. Now, we have been particularly interested in the stress responsive axis in humans and in our rats and mice. And we predicted that, in fact, with this tighter binding of beta endorphin, we would see significant alterations in this hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. I want you to note the different peptides and receptors on this cartoon of the normal human stress responsive axis. The mu opioid uh, antagonists, such as naloxone, naltrexone, and nemephine, block effects of beta endorphin and also in keflins at sites as indicated here in hypothalamus and anterior pituitary. And our group has shown that basal levels of the hormone cortisol are altered slightly higher, as shown in green, in persons with the variant. Wand at Hopkins and subsequently Kranzler and our own group and others have shown that if you give repeated injections of an antagonist here, naloxone, other studies, naltrexone or nemephine, you get greater enhancement of both cortisol, as you remember from the cartoon, the final product of increased CRF, increased ACTH, and then increased cortisol, 
and also in other studies, increased ACGH release in persons green with the G variant. Further, uh, building on this, uh, Valpicelli, Osen, and with Chuck O'Brien, as well as subsequently other groups, as shown on the left, the Oslin study, on the right, the Anton Goldman study, that persons with the A118G variant were much more likely to respond to naltrexone treatment of alcoholism. And three separate studies have shown this in moderately severe alcoholics, although not every study has shown it. Now, another way my lab dissects the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis in humans is to administer metyrapone. Metyrapone is a compound that blocks the production of cortisol at the adrenal level. So one gets no cortisol, thus the negative feedback by cortisol of the stress axis is gone. And the only thing remaining is the mu opioid receptor inhibition. But with those people with this variant, we predicted and went on to show, as shown in green, that they have much tighter binding of beta endorphin to the receptors at the hypothalamic and pituitary sites, and thus they actually have much less activation of ACTH when metyrapone is given. Normal healthy prototypic genetic persons Yellow, normal healthy persons with the A118G variant, homo or heterozygous, on the right, green, show profound differences. All healthy volunteers, all in a stress-minimized environment. And by working collaboratively with a colleague and friend uh, in Sweden, uh, Marcus Heilig, we have shown that this A118G variant is associated both with opiate addiction and with alcoholism. Findings now replicated in many other studies. Now this is a negation of gene environment. These are mice created by a professor at UPenn, Julie Blundy, and there have been two such models, one by Heilig, but Julie is one that we really prefer because it simply changes the one nucleic acid which then creates an analogous A118G variant at position 112 of the mouse normal genome. And then when we conduct our four-hour extended access self-administration in mice, and in mice, most groups are one to two hours, but young John in my group has been able to push it to four, you will see in green those with the G variant, just like the 118G in humans, essentially twice the amount of heroin self-administered on a 14-day period. By the way, we breed these animals. There's no change in father or mother, no changes in the environment, no change in socialization or the cages, and they're studied in parallel. So this is one residue, one nucleotide, yielding one amino acid change from asparagine to aspartic acid. And this one amino acid change, as studied by microdialysis in the striatum, those in green are with the variant, and you will see that two doses of heroin cause a much greater increase in dopamine levels in those regions by the mu opioid receptor being inhibited by morphine, inhibiting GABAergic interneurons and causing the release of dopamine, a well-established mechanism. So greater dopamine release, as we've heard in the previous speaker, important for self-administration, and greater self-administration. Now, other parts of the opioid system. Our laboratory has spent a great deal of time studying the kappa opioid system and its endogenous ligands, prodynorphin gene. And you'll see here on the far left-hand side a region where there is a well-described 68 base pair repeat. And on the right-hand side, in the three prime untranslated region in green, a threesome, a haplotype of three variants also associated with addiction. Now, after uh, a few studies, which were confusing because of both phenotyping, genotyping, 
and some bed studies that did not use long promoters. Our group and that group of Berrettini in Philadelphia, working separately with different population, show that primarily in African Americans, longer repeats, more repeats, three, four, or five, rather than one, two, and three, cause a greater amount of association with alcohol and cocaine addiction, and further studies by our group showed that the longer repeats create less dopamine, le excuse me, less dynorphin, and dynorphin countermodulates dopamine release in all species studied. So the countermodulator of the dopamine release is deficient in persons with longer repeats. And at the three prime untranslated region in human postmortem samples, we have shown similarly differences in dynorphin gene expression levels. And in healthy humans, healthy male humans, because we females have sporadically higher prolactin levels, we have been able to show that those with short repeats, that would be two or one or two copies, far right, have much greater basal levels of serum prolactin, showing less dynorphin inhibition through the hypothalamic channels, through dopamine D2 receptor, higher prolactin levels. And two copies of the long repeats causes much lower levels of prolactin with a heterozygote green in between. Now, ancestry does make a huge difference. And although we like to think everything is 100% the same, it's really 99.9, and that tenth of a percent makes an enormous difference. So our group, similar to that of David Goldman, uses almost 200 ancestral informative markers, or AIMS, and here in our very large cohorts now of seven, several hundred opiate-dependent persons and several hundred controls in different ethnic cultural groups. We will accept study of only those who are 70% or more of one background, as you see here in blue, 70% African background, in red, 70% Euro European background. And we do not have enough of any other ethnic cultural group to study. So what I'm going to show you now is some of our work with the uh, European group, but we have published both. And so far we have found that there's some 24 genes associated in the stress axis in Europeans, roughly uh, 35 in Africans. And when we look at shared genes in what I call both the stress and dopaminergic system, we find only 12, and there are two SNPs that are found in both ethnic culture groups. They are SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, of the dopamine D2 receptor, which we've heard a great deal about just now. So we have mu opioid receptor, dynorphin opioid receptor, dopamine D2 receptor. We've gone on to do studies with a hypothesis-oriented, created array of different gene polymorphisms, both common in Europeans or alternatively in African Americans. And these are the topics you're going to see papers that have issued from my lab or will be issuing. And I've touched on the opioid, but every single one of the opioid receptors, mu delta kappa, as well as the orphan receptor, we have shown to be associated with opiate addiction in at least one ethnic group. I've shown you the one slide on dopamine. I want, I'm going to show you the rest. But I'd like to just quickly show you our list of stress-responsive genes most of which are part of the HPA axis. And you'll see here old friends on the cartoons. Arginine vasopressin, which is quite equal to corticotropin releasing factor, AVP, CRF, both from the hypothalamus going down to the pituitary, the anterior pituitary in humans, with two separate receptors there, each driving the processing and release of pro opiomelanocortin, which yields beta endorphin and ACTH, the only peptide yielding beta endorphin, the only peptide yielding ACTH, which is obligatory to drive 
cortisol in humans and corticosterone in rats and mice. So we have found significant gene variants associated with opiate addiction and some also with cocaine addiction of arginine vasopressin and its receptor, of CRF and its receptors, and also of ACTH. And you will see here also galanine and two things you may not know so much about. So FK506 was not well known to any of us, I don't think, in medicine until extremely recently when three different European groups and then David Goldman in Bethesda and my group in New York have described this gene variance, and there are three in this particular gene, associated with many different things, including depression, anxiety, suicidality, and in our group with opiate addiction. This, of course, is a chaperone of, it's involved in, it's a cousin of the heat shock protein, and it's involved in protein folding and trafficking. Down to earth, it moves steroids like cortisol and corticosterone into the nucleus where they must act. So a novel but probably extraordinarily important gene with its variants in addictive disease and related comorbidities. Then the other one that I don't think was in all of our brain is the casein kinase 1 epsilon. Uh, we have found variants in this associated with opiate addiction and also with cocaine addiction. Gene expression has been found in certain to be changed in certain rodent models of specific addictive diseases. And we know now that this particular enzyme is involved in the circadian clock, our 24-hour cycling. And just to summarize, we have found that many of the gene variants that either we have described or others have described first and then subsequently, <coughs> there has been replication. And replication with different laboratories, different cohorts of subjects, not from a single bank, but each from their own cohorts. And ours is now close to 1,000 with Caucasian opiate dependent and with match controls. <clears throat> we also have collaboration going on with one person in this room, Vim van der Brink, and we have an entirely separate cohort from the Netherlands where we're carrying out further replicative studies. And then we have other cohorts from Sweden and Norway. Okay, so we found replication of the mu receptor, the delta receptor, the cap receptor, P, the, the dynorphin peptide gene, and also uh, some of these other genes I've told you about, including this FKBP5, which I cannot say the name of quickly, and galanine. And we also have found replication of, from EEP in Switzerland, our group in New York, of the CYP2B6, which is a major metabolizing enzyme for methadone, and also the ABCB1, a transporter of many opiate drugs in and out of the brain, as well as a variety of other diverse genes. Specific variants of specific genes, multiple groups showing association with opiate addiction. And then you add on the increased methylation for instance, that we have seen with the mu receptor, and it's becoming almost so complicated. The one thing, environment can be changed. Using HDAC inhibitors, we can change certain aspects of epigenetics, but we cannot really change the gene variants yet, and I always am an optimist. So I shall say yet. There's our laboratories on the ground floor of this gorgeous renovated building, and just to the right of it, what I call the ice cream cone of Sir Paul Nurse when he was president, and where we have common meeting ground in the cafeteria. Do visit my laboratory, and tomorrow I'll tell you about a new target for treating specific addictive diseases. Thank you.